witnessing the hardships of the pilgrims to Tibet, escaping through Death Valley, and listening to hymns in the most remote church in China. These are some of the highlights of an amazing adventure along the 1,500-year-old Tea and Horse Trail. Travelogue takes you on a legendary and perilous journey, joining a modern-day caravan as it winds its way among the rugged mountains from Yunnan to Tibet. It's a journey through a land of almost untouched culture and natural beauty. Retracing this fabled cultural and economic lifeline in China's history, join Travelogue on a three-part series, Adventure on the Tea and Horse Trail. The Tea and Horse Trail, a trade route first trodden 1,300 years ago, begins at Puar in Yunnan and ends at Lhasa in Tibet. Over the centuries, tea, horses and many other goods have made their way onto neighboring countries. The trail winds its way among some of the highest mountains in the country, where landslides and heavy snow are just some of the constant dangers. There are few other routes for cultural and economic exchange as perilous as this one. Hi, welcome to Travel Log Special in cooperation with Trends Traveller. I'm Mark and over the next 10 days we're going to take you on what is arguably one of the most notoriously high, adventurous and perilous journeys known to man, namely the Chama Gudao. This is the Tian Horse Trail which was established over a thousand years ago. I'm here in Shu He, which is our first stop and we're going to go from Lijiang all the way up through to Tibet. I can promise you that on this trip you're going to have adventure, mystery and hopefully a hell of a lot more. See you later. Our exploration of the Tian Horse Trail begins with the Qinglong Bridge, the symbol of Shu He. Built 600 years ago, it's the oldest bridge in the whole region. It's also a fine place just to sit and watch the world go by. Shu He is a peaceful place where time doesn't just stand still, it actually seems to be flowing slowly backwards. A crystal clear waterway zigzags across it and disappears among a cluster of ancient buildings. When you see how beautifully preserved the place is, it's hardly any wonder that Shu He has been included by UNESCO on its World Heritage List. The leisurely pace of life creates a unique sense that this is somewhere that time forgot. This part of Yunnan is home to the Nasi people. One of the many interesting things about the Nasi is their women, who are known to be hardworking and resilient. As the sixth stop on the Tian Horse Trail, the men of Shu He would often be away on the trail, which we can still see today. Check out this cool shop. Wow. Now how old is that? That actually looks like something that the Chama Gudao might have had and put their tea in or something. So maybe this shop has got more stuff. Let's have a look, let's have a look. What do you reckon this was? It's probably really dark at night. So they'd be looking around. This would have come in useful. This would be one of the things I would have taken. Good choice. A title you hear mentioned a lot here is Ma Guoto, the head of a caravan. He has to be both strong in character and in body if he's to manage a caravan along this long and arduous journey. Often, he'd use his own horses to carry the merchant's goods. Throughout the history of the Tian Horse Trail, the Nasi people produced more than their fair share of Ma Guoto. So if we're going to meet some of these legendary figures, Shu He is obviously a place to look. These walls really look very, very worn out. It's quite something. Can't believe there's not really much space for the horses here. Oh, bit of a new door there, bit of a new door. So uh, they've had a bit of renovation, haven't they? Let's go check out the rest of the house. It was quite surreal waking up in the beautiful surroundings of this peaceful, ancient town. It felt more like being in an alpine village during the summer. People were slowly going about their daily business in much the same way as they have for hundreds of years. 
I've managed to get some information about a Maguoto, and so we're off to see if we can meet him. Grandpa Zhang, now 83 years old, is still working. Although these days, he's running his own business making caravan accessories like this genuine mobile phone holder. He was 12 when he set out on his first journey along the Tian Horse Trail. Nowadays, people come from all over the world just to listen to him and to buy some of his goods as souvenirs. But I'm more interested in his first-hand experience that he recalls as though they happened only yesterday. I've actually been told that once it started raining, let's have a look. If I'm doing this right, <laughs> you just flip on the other side, and there you go. Pretty waterproof, I, I, I assume. But yeah, still very comfortable. I don't know which way I prefer. This one, I'm, it's a bit more rock and roll, this one. I quite like it. Six thirty in the morning. This is our first day, and there's a high level of excitement to match the high altitude. The people from Trends Traveller are checking every last detail: the food, the cars, the oxygen. That's no surprise with a convoy of 21 cars and 83 people to look after. For most of us, this is the trip of a lifetime. Whether we come for the culture, the scenery, or even romance. Oh, <laughs> 我是这一次茶马古道的领队李宏毅李宏毅李宏毅李宏毅李宏毅李宏毅李宏毅李宏毅李宏毅李宏毅李宏毅李宏毅李宏毅李宏毅李宏毅李宏毅李宏毅李
in a place blessed by Mother Nature where the scenery is so incredibly beautiful, Tibetan and Yi people have had no trouble making a happy home for themselves. Well, I'll tell you what, two minutes ago, I had my sunglasses on. Well, probably about five, five minutes ago, I had my sunglasses on and it's now raining like hell, really raining hard. They say that the weather in the mountains is uh, much like a monkey's face, ever changing. For the last few hours, we've had sun and rain, rain and sun, as if the weather can't quite make up its mind. No sooner do we arrive in Shangri-La town than we're whisked off to the renowned Tsongzhan Lin Temple, a magnificent lamasery carved into the hillside and the largest Tibetan Buddhist temple in Yunnan. This is going to be my very first glimpse of Tibetan Buddhist culture. I find myself being lured up the stairs by the melodic sound of a beautiful voice. Oh, so I've made it to the top here at the Tongdan Lin Temple, also known as the Small Patala Palace, which is extremely important in uh, Tibetan Buddhist religion. And apparently they've got jewellery that's been collected over hundreds and hundreds of years. Built in the 17th century, the Tsongzhan Lin Temple is a treasure trove of cultural relics, including eight gilded Sakyamuni statues over 200 years old and a collection of Tanga scroll paintings in golden ink. This temple is home to more than 700 Buddhist monks. Buddhism became a major presence in Tibet towards the end of the 8th century. To Tibetans, Buddhism is more than just a religion. It's a philosophy emphasizing compassion and self-sacrifice. Children as young as five are sent here to become monks. This place is pretty empty right now because we're here in late afternoon. But if we came here at eight o'clock in the morning, we'd find over a hundred monks congregated, talking, debating, and exchanging ideas about Buddhism. To, to reach the highest level, which is the equivalent of a doctorate, you'd actually have to really, really have a deep knowledge of Buddhism. So they come here, they walk around, and they ask a question like this. So you say, ask a question. If you want to take the question, you put your hand up here. It's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. Ooh, this looks like somewhere that... Ah, here we go. All money buy me home. Tibetan saying to bring me peace and good luck. And uh, so I'm going to put a bit of money in here and hope the Buddha brings me good luck too. Not far from the Lamasri, I come across a Tibetan farm. Now, this is my chance to see what life's like for an ordinary Tibetan family here. Time for some butter tea. 